Last week we looked at the first two. Yes. Uh, last week we looked at the first two portions of he. Oh, sorry, of the chapter on the new covenant of grace by Sam. Right? Yeah. We looked at the establishment of the new covenant, and then we looked at the blessings of the new covenant. And now, part two. It's a big chapter. Even though it's not super long, I thought we would spend time on it. We're going to look at the foundation of the new covenant, the kingdom of the new covenant, and the people of the new covenant. Keep in mind, the foundation of the new covenant is technically something that we've already covered in a previous chapter, the covenant of redemption. So let's look at that. The foundation of the new covenant. Sam writes, the covenant of redemption is the foundation of the new covenant. The covenant of redemption was a covenant of works from the Father to the Son. The Son had a mission, a work to complete, with a reward suspended on condition of His obedience. Jesus willingly and perfectly fulfilled that covenant of works He Himself said that it is finished. The new covenant of grace mediates the blessings obtained in the covenant of redemption. In other words, the new covenant is the fulfilled covenant of redemption mediated to those for whom the Son was appointed head. Where was the appointed head? In the covenant of redemption. So this portion of the chapter is going to help all of us, I hope so, and I'll clarify with you if it does, understand the relationship between the covenant of redemption and the covenant of grace. There is a sense in which we can say that it is one, it is unified because the covenant of grace is just the eternal covenant of redemption breaking into time. But at the same time, we need to also acknowledge that there is a distinction because there's a difference in the parties of the covenant, son and father, while in, in redemption, covenant of redemption, while in the covenant of grace, it is the covenant of redemption being accomplished and now it's the son, the mediator, and his people. See, you see how that works? One is the foundation of the other. So again, when we think about God's covenant of grace, the covenant of salvation, progressively revealed throughout the Old Testament, and then fulfilled or sealed or formally ratified in the new covenant, all of this is based upon that agreement in eternity past, which we call, and we keep saying it, but I, I hope after this series we're not going to forget it, right? The covenant of redemption. Yes. What does ratification mean? Ratified uh, is similar to the word sealing. So when you say that a covenant is ratified, uh, for example, if you write the contract, that is one thing. The contract exists, all the stipulations are there, but it's not ratified until it's signed. It's not enforced oh. officially and formally until it is signed. So the same thing when you think about a marriage ceremony, um, there's all of the things that happen around it. There's a ceremony, there's vows, there's all of those things. Um, but then, of course, there's a concept of the actual signing of the contract and the two become one flesh. And then before God, that whole covenant of marriage then comes together. It is from then on that you guys are married. Now, of course, marriage is not a perfect parallel to use, but it is the best human covenant that we have in order to understand the covenantal relationship between God and man. For example, um, I, I did not uh, eternally choose my wife for marriage. <laughs> that's impossible, right? That's, that's where the parallel is a little bit different because when it comes to the covenant of grace, ratified when Jesus actually sheds his blood, well, what's so amazing about that is that that uh, bride for whom he died was chosen in eternity. Okay, so I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Um, if you want to think about the relationship between the eternal covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace in time, Charles Hodge, in his systematic theology, can actually help us out. Still, he says, it does not remove the incongruity of Christ being present as at once a party and mediator of the same covenant. There are, in fact, two covenants relating to the salvation of fallen man. The one between... God and Christ. Which one is that? Covenant of redemption. Covenant of redemption. Very good. And the other between God and His people. So what is that now? 
Yes, that's right. So now Christ comes and now his people are brought into the covenant. These covenants differ not only in their parties, Hodge is helpful here, but also in their promises and conditions. The latter, the covenant of grace, is founded on the former, the covenant of redemption. Of the one Christ is the mediator in surety of, oh, sorry, of the one, Christ is the mediator in surety of the other, he is the one, he is one of the contracting parties, right? And remember the language that Sam used pre in a, previously, which is that when we call the eternal pactum salutis the covenant of redemption, we are using metaphorical language here. Once again, it is not like, it is not exactly like a marriage covenant wherein the two come together and make this decision to choose uh, to, to um, come into this covenant together and so on and so forth. We're talking metaphorically about something that was decreed by God in his three persons in eternity past. So I want to ask you guys, uh, is everything clear in terms of the relationship between the covenant of redemption and the covenant of grace or are there any clarifications with that? Yeah. I just want to ask the question, which is, of the one, Christ is the mediator, I get that, and surety. What's a surety? Uh, surety. I know what sort of means, but... Yes, yes. It, please. Um, so it is related to the word assurance. Yeah. Assurity is, he, it is promised, uh -huh. it is promissory. We can also speak of the Holy Spirit, who indwells us as our surety. Um, related concepts would be dowry or down payment, ensuring that all of the goods will be delivered. It's a surety. And he said he's the secure. He is the secure. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's another related concept. Yes, absolutely. He is the pledge. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's why we maintain he is the mediator. He's the one that mediates the covenant, stands in the gap. He is the surety. He is the one that ensures the fulfillment of the covenant. Another word? Okay, fine. But I, I've been holding back, but here's the more modern word. The guarantor. Okay. He is the guarantor. All right? Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. So, the new covenant is God the Father covenanting two sinners forgiveness of sins and eternal life based on faith in God the Son, through whom they receive all the benefits. So again, let us say that the new covenant of grace is a kept covenant of works, mediated to the world. Again, I say, it's a covenant already kept, completed, and then delivered to God's elect. This is why we call it not of works, our works, but of grace. Because it comes to us as a covenant that has already been kept. How amazing is that? Yeah. Now that's why it's really sovereign grace. Yeah. That's why we believe in monergism, right? It's all God who delivers the goods and the promises. That's why Paul says, in him we have obtained an inheritance. Yeah. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Uh, an inheritance is not, at least usually the way we talk about it, is not really something that you work for or earn. An inheritance is something that a person can actually receive just by being born into the family. And isn't that what regeneration is? It's being born again into the family of God. Hebrew says, therefore he is, we read this, the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a debt has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So you see the contrast that's being made not only between the covenant of grace and the Adamic covenant of works, but there's even a contrast here being made between the new covenant and the old covenant. The new covenant is able to forgive transgressions committed under the first covenant. You understand the implication of this? The first covenant, in and of itself, could not redeem us from the transgressions that we ultimately committed and separated us from God. The new covenant can. 
and Christ is the federal head of the new covenant, and he was appointed as such in the covenant of redemption, eternally. Apart from union with Christ, no one can partake of the blessings and benefits of the new covenant. Uh, I remember earlier, Brother Lucas was saying how, in, in one sense, this is kind of like the easiest, most straightforward chapter, isn't it? And that's good. As Christians, this should be very straightforward to us in understanding the new covenant. But at the same time, I'd also like to say, well, let's give, let's give the previous chapter some credit as well. I think most of you are having an easier time now understanding what's going on in this chapter because of all the groundworks and foundations that have been laid in part one and part two and part three. And understand that at the center of all of salvation reality is this concept of union with Christ. Uh, there are, this is not really different schools of thoughts that we should divide into two per se, but in Christian re and Reformed circles, there's often a difference in emphasis in understanding what is at the heart of all the blessings of salvation. Some would go directly to the blessing itself of justification, that that's the essence of if you really want to understand what it means to be saved, you've got to understand justification, and that's the priority. Mm. And that's true. That is important. But I would say a good emphasis is not to be a, a strict justificationist, maybe if you will, but it would be good to be strong unionists. What does that mean? That is to say that if we want to understand what we have, in terms of salvation, what salvation is. Before going to any of the blessings that flow out of Christ, emphasize that at the center of it, of it all is this amazing concept of union with Christ. That's where it all flows from. That's where it all flows from. So even, I, I would say, I would even say that the language covenant of redemption, although good, historic, even confessional language, we must maintain is metaphorical language. Because I think at the heart of it all, in terms of God choosing His elect people and all of these things, we can find at the heart of that this, if I may use human terms, desire to unite a people to Himself. Union with God, and to be specific, union with Christ. We've got to begin there. G.I. Packer always would like to say that adoption is at the heart of biblical Christianity. And there is, and I would say even then, what is adoption if it weren't for us being united to the Son, united to Christ? When we say, why did God make you at all things, which we do in our children's catechism, for His glory. It's for His glory. Now, what does that look like? Places like Colossians would say that in Christ, God is doing what? He is reconciling all things to Himself. What's at the very center of that in terms of redeeming sinners? Union with Christ. That is at the center of our, should be at the center of understanding of salvation. Yes. Uh, how do we avoid the era of N.T. rights, um, given that view? Uh, specifically, what are you speaking of? Uh, the era of N.T. Wright is that um, he puts adoption as logically prior to justification. What that means is that he says that uh, what saves a person is not being seen as righteous before the uh, sight of God, but being united with Christ. Yeah. He, this he says in order to defend his Armenianism, because to him it is only the objective personal um, assent to Christ being Lord uh, that saves a person and not the individualistic subjective work of the Spirit. Okay, and this is a very big one because it, we, we could get into um, his, his wrong thinking of justification by faith alone um, and a wrong understanding of the Reformation understanding of justification. If you guys know who, don't know who N.T. Wright is, you can, you can search him. He, he has some good stuff to say, to be honest. He, he has a really sharp mind. Um, but N.T. Wright, you know, there's that famous John MacArthur video where he says, N.T. Wright is anti-wrong. You know, that, that uh, 
is a very John Carpenter thing to say. And uh, he, he gets this wrong. He specifically promotes what's known now as a new perspective on coal, the NPP. Um, and he does this thing where he basically starts to say that no, there was no dichotomy, there was no struggle between some kind of legalistic, Pharisaic Judaism versus the um, the biblical um, New Testament revel clearer, clearer revelation of justification by faith alone. He actually downplays the Reformation at times and the need for that. So to answer your question, Ilya, I think we can maintain together that the heart of our salvation is union with Christ, but at the same time, we need to maintain that the actual linchpin of us going from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light in terms of God's disposition towards us and our communion with God, that linchpin is justification. And you can, you can do uh, logical priorities in salvation, you can do all of that, but the point is, coming to Christ is going from condemnation under the covenant of works into justification under the covenant of grace. He would have issues as well with his covenant theology that we can handle. Uh, but the way to balance it out is to do exactly that, to simply balance it out, to see that at the heart of it is union with Christ, and from there, necessarily, these salvation blessings flow. And there's no chronology, per se, there's no you're adopted, then later on you're justified, and so on. It is a full package. And I would go even further than that and say, let's go with Calvin, when he talks about the, the duplis gratis, or the double blessing, that the moment you're saved, you're immediately blessed through union with Christ, with both justification and sanctification. And that moment of salvation is the beginning of that lifelong sanctification. So you just have to go back to a more classical reform soteriology, and you'd be able to avoid anti rights errors, I would say. Uh, Romans 8 tells us, You Christians, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to you. To be indwelt by the Spirit of Christ is to be united to Christ. This is all connected. The Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity are inseparable. So for you to be indwelt by God's Spirit is to be united to Christ, is to become a child of God. One John says, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Oh, let's stop right there. Why am I emphasizing union with Christ? I'll tell you why I'm emphasizing union with Christ. Where is life? Where is it found? According to John. In His Son. In His Son. Son. So what does that mean? If you want life, you need to be in Christ. You need to be in Colossians. Our life is hid in Christ. Somebody wants to ask you, what does that even mean to be in Christ? We're not physically in Christ. Yes, right? He's in heaven. But actually, even if you do think physically, that can help to let you understand it. Let's imagine you were like a tiny person, little, and here's Christ, and He's great. And God takes you, and He places, He opens up Christ, and He places you and hides you inside of Him. So you're inside of Christ now, and therefore the Father looks upon you, and who does He see? Christ. He sees Christ. The Father's wrath, which was once towards you, has been deviated because Christ has already satisfied it. And instead of looking upon you with wrath and fury against sin, what does He see? Right. His beloved Son, in whom He is well pleased. Union with Christ. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Yes. So, if you went back to that yeah. at first, union, even if you maybe read it in a book called Fourfold State of Thomas Boston, yeah. Mystical Union. I'm not going to go into that. Have your own reading. Good book. It's all about the person that's just hitting on it. And then when you see that 
conjunctive prepositional phrase, and this is the testimony. Well, where did we get that from? From what we were talking about in your sermon today, mm. reckon on that the blood was poured out, was poured out the blood and water, and that was the testimony yeah. that came out, and that goes to that. Yes. Which connects to what you just said. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. That, that connects absolutely. Is that as far as so? So think about that way. That the fountain opens. We are cleansed. We are united to Man. the second person of the Trinity. And what does that do? That brings us into communion with the Trinity. It brings us into communion with God. Hebrews 6 tells us, for when God, lots of Hebrews say, when God made a promise to Abraham, this is important, it's using the, the, the Abrahamic covenant as a sort of example to help us understand what's going on. Since he had no one greater by whom to swear, what did God do? He swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So take note, what's, what's happening here? Hebrews points to God's oath to Abraham as an example of how God confirms his covenantal promises with oaths for the people's benefit. Now if we continue, we read in the rest of chapter 6, So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, in which it is, number one, it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled to refuge, we, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, or you might say Christ, our surety, guarantor. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what's happening? Hebrews now points out that Christ's priesthood is also confirmed by an oath. So they go back to Abraham. Do you remember how God made an oath? And that was a surety, that was a pledge, that was a sure promise. Now... God appoints His Son, Jesus, as the priest and mediator of His people. And if you doubt it, well, be reminded that He confirmed it as well with an oath. You are a priest forever. So what do we learn? Yes? Uh, sorry. So on the on Christ Melchizedekan um, uh, priesthood. Um, so if a, the Abrahamic covenant is part of that which we call the old covenant, yep, yep. and under the old covenant ceremonial law, under which Jesus was born, only Levites could become um, priests. Why can Jesus be a priest? If Melchizedek um, and Abraham, as their interaction, is part of the Old Covenant. Yeah, because Jesus um, did not come to be an Old Covenant priest. The very nature of His coming as the priest, the great high priest of His people, um, is to actually supersede the Levitical priesthood. Um, so in the same way as he is a man who sheds his blood and not an animal who sheds his blood, the point of fulfillment is not to be just like the old but only a little bit better. The point of fulfillment is actually to supersede the old in a great way. So you're absolutely right. Uh, Jesus cannot be a quote-unquote old covenant priest according to Levitical law because he's descended not of Levi. He is, though, a descendant or in the order of Melchizedek, which is a priesthood that has been appointed for him in eternity. And this is where the layers come in, because Christ is not only fulfilling Mosaic law, he is also fulfilling the covenant of works given unto him by his Father, appointed in eternity past, that he would be a priest for a people, and be a sacrifice for them, and mediate between God and man. Yeah, Hebrews 7, 16 calls... Yeah. You talk about Hebrews 7, 16. Yeah, who has become a priest, and talking about Jesus, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, that's what you're speaking about, that's carnal, yeah. 
but by the power of an indestructible life. Yes, so a comparison, or actually you might say a contrast is being made between how Levitical priests are appointed in the Old Testament, which is through carnal descent, bodily descent, while Jesus' priesthood came about by divine, eternal appointment as the eternal and God, the Son of God, who is a priest forever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Big, big discussion of that in in, um, in Hebrews. Absolutely. But what is Christ? Once and for all? And not only that, forever. You're a priest forever. So, the federal headship of Christ and the blessings that flow through Him in covenant to His people are grounded and founded in God's oath to Christ. Right? So, before you guys, before you even think, I should, I should say it this way. If you enjoy thinking about the doctrine of predestination, right, that's, that's a deep doctrine. That's a deeper doctrine. And that's something to really, to really meditate on and chew on, right? Often what we do is this, though. God, eternally decreed, chose me to be saved. That's my doctrine. Ephesians says He chose us in Christ. So first and foremost, the elected one is the Son. Mm -hmm. The elected one is Christ. And we are only rightly called elected, chosen, set apart people of God because of being put in Christ. Being brought in relationship with Christ. Our divine election from eternity past is actually an outpouring of love of the Father from the Father to the Son, and as the oil goes down the beard of the high priest and touches his garments and so on, as the psalmist says, the love of the Father for the Son is made available to his people and through the Son and through the Son alone. That's really how we should think about election. The Father first and foremost appointing the Son and then a people predestined in Him, in Christ. And this is further developed in Hebrews 7, which teaches that the covenant of which, of which Christ is the guarantor is a better covenant since it perfects His people because His priest was appointed by an eternal oath. And the old covenant priests did not have this oath. They didn't get this oath, did they? Did, 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 did God tell any of them, you are a priest forever? Of course not. And they could not perfect people. So to reject Christ, and this is the argument of Hebrews, and to go back to the Levitical system is to reject the Father who swore this priesthood to His Son. Okay? It's, it's a big deal. If you're saying, I don't really know if Christ is sufficient, I don't really know if Jesus is the only way, what you're really doing is you are calling the Father a liar. That when God the Father swore an oath to His Son that you will be the priest, you will be the mediator, He is the way, you're basically saying, I don't know if the Father really meant that, or maybe He is a liar. So the new covenant is not like the old covenant that Israel broke. It's not my language. That's Jeremiah 31, 32's language. Not like the one that they previously wrote. Not like the old covenant, per se. It is a covenant already kept and mediated in Christ to an elect people, that's where we get those words, covenant of grace. Founded upon an eternal promise, a pledge, and an oath by the Father to the Son, and therefore flowing to His elect people. Yes. Outside of the line of priesthood. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's what you said. Yes, absolutely. Just clearly said. Yeah. So, so the thing is, um, uh, how do we? Um, this is a question recently asked. How do we avoid the charge of a quote-unquote over-realized eschatology in our hermeneutic of Jeremiah 31? In Jeremiah 31, it says that they will know the Lord, and they will no longer need teachers. Well, we as the New Covenant Church do know the Lord, but we do still need teachers who are given to us as a gift. Um, uh, is Jeremiah 31 really only speaking of um, a heavenly reality, as our Presbyterian brethren would say, or is it a already not yet reality? Both technically, whether you're a Pado Baptist or Baptist, believe that it is 
some kind of already but not yet. Mm -hmm. um, so a little, some a little bit more, some a little bit less. But the issue here is not, I would say, it's not really, I mean, people will say your eschatology is underrealized, your eschatology is overrealized, you're expecting the church to be perfect already, you're expecting to be, the church to be always filled with uh, unregenerate, and it, it goes kind of like that, and that's, like, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a legitimate conversation to have and talk about what do we mean by already but not yet. But I think the issue lies here. If we believe in the already but not yet nature of the new covenant, of, of the uh, the kingdom of God, the new creation, that we are the ones upon whom the end of the ages has come, that the new creation kingdom of God has broken into time in this world through Jesus Christ, and we are now brought into his kingdom now, right now, then what we really need to ask ourselves is not just how much of Jeremiah 31 is totally fulfilled, because we all believe in already but not yet. We're all willing to say Jeremiah 31 is a prevailing reality right now, but not yet climax, not yet culminated, consummated. Uh, there's still uh, there's still false ones among the flock. There's still all of that. The real question is what what pattern should the new covenant church follow in terms of recognizing people of the church and admitting people into the membership of the covenant community? That's the real question. We're not saying that there are no false ones among our pale. There are. But we, um, as Reformed Baptists, want to maintain that the pattern that we're following in terms of admitting people into church membership, and I'm actually about to get to this in a few slides, is the pattern of the new covenant itself, because that's the membership. That, that is what we were entering, we entered into membership of. And that is what? Those united to Christ. And I think even in that passage, the already of the they will not need teachers is actually saying that we will all be taught of Christ. And we will all know Christ. And we will have, a, if I may use a popular evangelical phrase, a personal relationship with Christ. Christ, through His Spirit, is the great teacher of the church. We can all come to the Word of God. It does not mean there will no, there will no longer be pastors and preachers in this life. So that's the heart of the issue. Even though we know we are still in an imperfect state, awaiting consummation, what pattern should the church follow in terms of who's in and who's out? And we say the pattern of the new covenant by design. So when somebody comes to us and they make a profession of faith, and what we're doing when we admit them into the membership of the church is we are affirming that they are a fellow member of the new covenant. Will it sometimes fail, our policies and so on? Will a false one get in? Yes, that will happen. And that's why Jesus said that during this age, there's still something called excommunication. There's still church discipline and all of that. So we both believe in already but not yet, but the question is what pattern do we follow for new covenant, uh, for church membership? And we say new covenant membership. And what is new covenant membership? It is that which is described in Jeremiah 31. We're not infallible, so sometimes we're going to get it wrong, but we've got to seek to follow that pattern as, as Christ builds his church. Yes? Uh, brother, you mentioned about the already but not yet. Brother uh, is talking about also as kind of So, you know, we, we know that we have different views, you know, and depending on what scatological, you know, school you follow. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think every single scatology school follows the already. Yes, that's, that's what I'm saying. All, yes. Yeah, all of them. However, I think the main issue of that already kind of yet is the nature of the kingdom mm -hmm. of God. And that, that, that's, what, that's what the difference you know, actually, um, is made between all those schools. Sure. Yeah. So can you can you please speak a little bit about the nature of the kingdom, and now that Jesus Christ has brought the kingdom? Yeah. That, so I would love to answer that, but that's that's the next chapter. The okay. Uh, okay. so the next chapter is the mystery of Christ, chapter thirteen, chapter fourteen, the eschatological nature of the kingdom. Yeah. But yeah, we'll 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 hold for that one. So. Just remember, before we leave this point, guys, uh, there's a distinction between two kinds of covenants that we have already learned, and we need to keep on being reminded of this. 
Uh, there are those covenants that follow a wall principle. There's a, a re-stipulation of obedience sanctioned to the covenant partner. And in form, we look at that in the Bible and we go, ah, that's a works covenant. That's a covenant of works. That's something where there are conditions that need to be fulfilled in order for the person to either enter the covenant or to continue in the covenant. But then you've got those that are based upon promise and there is a reception on the side of the, uh, the sorry, there's a stipulation given to us of receiving reception and there are still sanctions, but where are the sanctions made? Or who, to whom are the sanctions made? It, the, in a covenant of grace, it's made to the covenant imposer. And that's why we call it a covenant of grace. Does the covenant of grace, in a, in, in, in a, in a technical sense, have stipulations and sanctions and so on? The answer is yes. But the reason why it's a covenant of grace is that, what did we say? They have already been met by Christ. When was the sanction? When? I hate to say that. But when were the sanctions given? In eternity. In the covenant of redemption. And Christ came and He actually met them. But you might ask. Yes. In a lot of what you just said now, why do Baptists reject Keisha's covenant theology? Uh, they don't. He just has a different uh, emphasis. Okay. Um, there is a unity. It's, it's, it's kind of a, it might get weird, but it's similar to the Trinity. Uh, it's one plan of redemption, but um, in terms of revelation, there seems to be an eternal pact, and then there's a breaking into time. And the terms that we use for that to distinguish between what was agreed upon and the parties in eternity past, and what actually happens in redemptive history, is the covenant of redemption and the covenant of grace. And what Keach likes to say is he likes to say it's, it's one covenant. Now, how valid is that? How useful is that? Um, you could use that to emphasize the oneness of the covenant, the oneness of God's plan of redemption. But at the same time, I think there's still great benefit in distinguishing. So for me, it would be almost like, do we emphasize that God is one? Or do we emphasize that God has three persons? Because both are true. Mm. So do we emphasize the unity of the what we call covenant of redemption and grace? I think yes, we emphasize it because it's one plan. It's one plan, it's one agreement. But are there different functions and distinctions that are apparent there? And therefore, in our theological thinking, it would be helpful to distinguish? I also think yes. I think it's good for us to distinguish between the two, one in eternity and one in time. So categories for us. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. And you might ask, does it? The covenant, I mean, I get it, covenant of, oh yeah, and by the way, the reason why, one of the most important reasons why we distinguish and why we, we uh, must distinguish is because what, of what we've said about the covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption is a covenant of works for Christ to fulfill. The covenant of grace brings us into relationship with God and the works that Christ has done becomes credited to us. So you see why it's, it's very helpful to distinguish? He distinguishes between the federal heads though. So he uses Adam and, and Christ being the covenant of grace and works as well. But no, no, no. That's the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, Adam to Christ. Yeah, so he sees two covenants. No, absolutely, covenants. absolutely. What, what we're saying is the covenant of redemption is a covenant of works for Christ. Mm -hmm. In the covenant of redemption, the Father orders Christ to fulfill certain conditions. Mm -hmm. So we want to be careful to still distinguish because the covenant of grace is not a covenant of works for us. It definitely. Yeah. And so the covenant of redemption is a covenant of works for Christ. For Christ. Yeah. And the covenant of grace is a and covenant did. already fulfilled yeah. and we're brought into. Mm -hmm. So you see how it's helpful to still distinguish um, in, in the way that we think about it. One of the polemical reasons why Keach wanted to emphasize, Benjamin Keach wanted to emphasize the unity of the covenant is actually in his arguments against paedo baptism, against infant baptism. Why? He wanted to say that the members of the covenant of grace are no different from the ones that are elected in the covenant of redemption. There's no difference. It is unified. It is one plan of redemption. And that's why he emphasized that. Okay. Uh, but I want to say, uh, but I want to, uh, deal with that question as well. Yeah. 
And then, uh, you know what you're saying? I understand that one is that Benjamin Kitch was yes. uh, teaching on, on his, his view about his companies. However, um, how do you see the time with the current affairs being established in, in, in history time and history? So, because when we see from the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden, we can see already grace. Yes. From there, it's, yes. it's already grace. But, it's, it's, but then, sometimes you talk about the establishment of the covenant of grace yes. in Christ. Yes. Right? So, but what happened during that time from the Eden, the Garden of Eden, to when Jesus Christ actually yeah. came? Yeah, so very very good question, um, and that's why I think the the um, what do you call that thing? The diagram that we use um, is very very helpful. And so the way that um, our confession puts it, and um, I'll, I'll quickly read it, and then afterwards I'll give a quick short explanation uh, on God's covenant, is that the covenant of grace, okay, in chapter seven, paragraph three. This covenant is revealed in the gospel, first of all, to Adam in the promise. So listen to these words. Well, why didn't it say ratified? Because it hadn't been yet. So we'll look at the words. Revealed in the gospel, first of all, to Adam in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman. And afterwards, by farther steps, progressive revelation, until the full discovery thereof was, and here's the word, completed, fulfilled, if you will, in the New Testament. And then it says it's founded in the eternal covenantal transaction. So this is why the New Testament authors call the Old Testament covenants, covenants of promise. Promise. They were promissory. So these promises throughout the Old Covenant are promises that look forward to the New Covenant, and when God's elect believe upon these promises, they become members of the new covenant, even before it is established by the blood of Christ. So here's a very helpful word, guys. Um, and many theologians, especially in the later 17th century, would use this. And later on, I've I read this in Francis Turretin. Believe it or not, I've read this in Thomas Aquinas as well, a Roman Catholic theologian. The idea of retroactive application. When we say that the covenant of grace is formally ratified when Christ actually came and died on the cross and so on and so forth, we're not leaving the old covenant saints in the dark. Yeah. Even in the days of types and shadows, the benefits of salvation which Jesus procured on the cross, even if it's a future thing, are retroactively applied to those who believe in the promised Messiah by faith. So, guys, watch the words. Covenant of grace in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, promised, revealed by farther steps under the New Testament, completed, fulfilled, ratified, sealed. Is that helpful? Oh, is this yeah. why, why You're thinking I'm, helpfully? Good. Yeah, this is why I, I was asking the question because I always find issues with that word when, when theologians use the word establishment. Of the covenant, I, I find an issue with that, with that yeah. word. Mm. Yeah, but when when you use the word ratify, that's much clearer. Sure, yeah. it's, right. it's complete. Yeah, it's right. so, yeah. 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 yeah, and just like the Lord suffered, yes. I mean that's what He means when He says, "This is the new covenant in My blood." Did you, in time in history. Did Jesus shed his blood in Genesis 3.15? Right. No. Well, he, he didn't even become incarnate yet. No. Now, was this something pledged in eternity past? Yes, it was. But we're talking about historical, redemptive, re, uh, redemptive history. When was the new covenant formally established by the blood of Christ? It is in his first coming. Right? That's why theologians use things like established, ratified, sealed, fulfilled, or... Uh, Completed with an EA completed. Yes. What? Of course, you know one of those terms. Yeah. Ratify said, for example, uh, promissory to the future. Yes. yes. Although I think that is a phrase. Yes, uh, absolutely. Effectual. It's already effectual. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually important to know. Yeah, so when we speak of, very good, when we speak of redemption accomplished and applied. Yeah. 
We're not just saying that the benefits of redemption are applied from the cross forward. We're also saying that the benefits of redemption were already being applied even from Genesis 3.15 onwards. What we're avoiding saying is that Genesis 3.15 is the establishment of the covenant of grace, right? That's what we're avoiding. Because then you get, you know, the, you know, the theology, right? That there are certain people that get, you know, they can get into the covenant of grace even though they're not promised in the covenant of redemption. You know what I'm saying? Okay, that's not what doesn't the covenant of grace have a requirement from us? Wait a minute. Yeah, actually, don't we need to repent of our sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't that kind of a requirement per se? Yes, but even this is worked in our hearts by God. Mm-hmm. So we want to maintain the uniqueness of the new covenant of grace. It is not like the ones that have come before. In this one, so many of the prophets are looking forward to it. Don't miss out on the uniqueness of it. They're all looking forward to it, to a time when, what did we read this morning? Spirit, in your hearts, I will cause you to obey. Is it a command to repent and to put your trust in the Lord, to call upon His name? Is that a command? It is. Can you do it apart from the Spirit? No. No. So here's the beauty of the new covenant of grace. The Spirit works it in our hearts that we might repent and believe. When Ephesians tells us that it's a gift from God, that includes the whole package, even faith. It's not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. So the new covenant is the covenant of grace. It unfailingly and infallibly blesses all of its children. They all know the Lord, going to what was asked earlier. So how about that? You go, oh, over-realized eschatology. How is it over-realized? Don't you agree that if you've been regenerated and brought into the new covenant, you have a personal knowledge of the Lord? Yes. Right? Of course. And there we go. In Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 is a prevailing reality today. It really, really is. And that's what the, the, the pattern that the church should follow. We should be a people who all know the Lord. They all enjoy the forgiveness of sins. The certainty of this covenant rests on the covenant of redemption. The priesthood of Christ rests on the oaths the Father swore to the Son. The oaths have been sworn by God Himself. He who promised is faithful. We rest and rejoice in His faithfulness. So we're going to touch on the kingdom, but the details of the nature of the kingdom will come in chapter 14. Kingdom and covenant always go hand in hand. Here, no less than elsewhere in the scriptures, these concepts are intimately united. In the covenant of redemption, okay, now listen to this. The Father covenanted a kingdom to the Son. And in the new covenant, that kingdom is covenanted to Christ's people. Some of you remember, I gave a very short devotion one morning at the family camp where Jesus was speaking to his disciples. They were all worried about the clothes on their back and he was encouraging them not to worry. And he says, fear not, little father. For my father is delighted to give you the kingdom. You need to understand first and foremost that this kingdom is covenanted by the father to the son. And as the son enters into the world, he covenants this kingdom to us. This was a new creation kingdom of resurrected life. Jesus fills this kingdom with his people. This is our inheritance in Christ. John the Baptist preaching, Jesus' preaching was centered upon the gospel of the kingdom. God's kingdom is covenanted to the world through the new covenant. And this is why John the Baptist did it. Jesus did it. The apostles did it. We should do it. We must call people to believe in the gospel of the kingdom. Because they are people who are currently in the kingdom of darkness. They are outside the kingdom of Christ. And they need to repent and believe and be united to Christ. That they may enter into the kingdom of God. Knowing, of course, that that will be provided by the Spirit. So, in Luke 22, 29, Jesus speaks to his disciples and he says to them, And I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom. I truly enjoy it when Sam in the books likes to kind of, um, you know, poke fun at the ESV at times, only at times. I love my ESV, don't worry about it, I'm not really changing it anytime soon. Um, But there are some times where it's good to poke at it and go, well, is that really the best? Especially here, because the word assigned there is from the Greek word diatidemai. 
um, and here is Dayateto. I it was ass I assigned to you, as my father assigned to me a kingdom, and this comes from the Greek word. If you look up the Greek dictionary, it's Dayateke, which is the word that is commonly used to speak of a covenant, to cut a covenant, or to make a covenant. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The, the concept of making or cutting a covenant is very often, almost, I think every time, almost, translated as that word, that I'm thinking. So what we're seeing here, if you want to translate it consistently, could be like this. Jesus said to his disciples, And I covenant unto you, as my Father covenant, covenanted unto me. Okay. Just pause. Think about that for a moment. If you're a disciple of Christ, Know this. Hear the words of your Savior. I covenant unto you as my Father covenanted unto me. A king. A king. No wonder we are told, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Who are we to worry about things going on in this world when we are lacking, when we are missing some things, when things don't go our way, and we are crushed by the weight of anxiety and worry and all of these things, and it happens to all of us. I think we need to be reminded the kingdom of God is ours. It is our inheritance. We have all of it in Christ. Mm. So, how about the kingdom of the new covenant then? Well, the son's reward in the covenant of redemption was not only salvation for his people, but also a consummated kingdom. The kingdom was covenanted to him by his father and mediated to us in the covenant of grace. Think about the Lord's Supper. It's greater than the Passover because it commemorates the death of God's only son in our deliverance, not from Egypt, but out of darkness. And as the Apostle says, into the kingdom of his beloved Son. This is why, okay guys, think about this. As we meditate upon the supper and partake of it next week. By the way, even if there is, uh, I, I am going to be possibly preaching, uh, preaching twice supposedly, next week. What we'll do for that is we'll have the supper earlier. Because I don't want to miss that. Amen. This is why Jesus said he wouldn't drink the fruit of the vine until that day. When you were drinking anew in the kingdom of God. Because the Lord's Supper of the New Covenant for us looks forward to the full assembly of God's people in the new creation where there will be perfect harmony between God and us. And Jesus wants us to be reminded every time we partake of the Lord's Supper that He is not partaking of it where He is right now because the assembly hasn't arrived. The gathering is not there yet. And therefore we should anticipate. Lastly, the people of the new covenant. Well, this is where we get to the issue of membership. And I want to connect it to church membership. The membership of a given covenant is always determined by who your parents are, who your grandparents are, the federal head of that covenant. Guys, this is why we maintain. Even if we say that the Old Testament is just sprinkled with grace and, and even the, the promises to Abraham and even, you can find it in Moses, there's so much grace and graciousness. The reason why we don't call that the covenant of grace is because in those days, you could appeal to Abraham as your forefather and you have the genuine right to the land of Canaan. But you cannot appear to Abra appeal to Abraham as your father and on that basis say, I'm a member of the covenant of grace. Mm -hmm. Could you do that? No. Do you know some people who have tried to do that? Yeah. What are they called? Heresy. Exactly. <laughs> so let's not try to do that. And in this case, Jesus Christ is the federal head of the new covenant, the one through whom his blessings flow. And his federal headship was determined in the covenant of redemption. His sheep are those given to him by the Father. The people of the new covenant are the elect of God. They are those whom Paul loves to say are in Christ. So brothers and sisters, who are we? We are those in Christ. In Christ. Christ. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the new covenant, for the relationship between the new covenant and church membership. Well, this, this touches on the question that was asked earlier. Are we really saying 
that our local church in this world will always be perfect in its membership. That every member we ever admit is truly, invisibly, the elect of God. We can't see election. We're not perfect. We can only affirm what we can. Based upon, what do we like to say? A credible profession of faith. That's the basis of the New Testament. In the New Testament, it's very simple. To be a member of a church, you need to have a credible profession of faith, and you need to be a baptized believer. You need to be baptized. Now, um, do churches need to exercise wisdom in terms of membership processes to make sure we don't uh, mindlessly make errors that we could have avoided? Yes, we do do that. But the point is this. There is a relationship between, there should be a relationship between membership in the church and new covenant membership. Our desire is that we would admit people into the membership of our church as a sign of affirmation that they are fellow members of the new covenant. We believe in a believer's church, in believer's baptism. And when we recognize that because of our sin and because of our fallibility, we have made a wrong decision, the church must exercise the keys of the kingdom and make sure that the church is pure. Are we going to be perfect at it all the time? No. But this is our desire. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Guys, that's what the sacrament of baptism ought to signify. That's why we baptize upon profession of faith, because it is the only way we can find out or affirm to the best of our ability that someone is in the new covenant. That someone has been brought into that covenantal relationship with God and they know the Lord and they are forgiven of their sins and the Spirit dwells inside of them and therefore causes them to obey Him. And we don't need to make it complicated. What is one of the first signs that we know that the Lord has moved in a person's heart? Repent and believe. Conversion. Repent and believe. And that's the church's responsibility. We need to maintain this pattern to the best of our ability. So lastly, as we end this chapter on the people, uh, this chapter and this section on the people of God, know that this is our identity, brothers and sisters. We are those for whom the Father sent the Son. We are those for whom the Son died on the cross, in particular. To us, the Spirit applies Christ's benefits. We are a new humanity, in a new and last Adam. There's no condemnation for us. There's, there, we are no longer in the flesh, but in the Spirit. We are sons of God to whom the Spirit bears witness. We are co-heirs with Christ and partake of His glory. We are predestined, called, justified, and glorified. God will give us all things that were given to the Son, even the new creation kingdom itself. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. We share in the inheritance of the saints in life. And membership in the new covenant is defined and delineated exclusively by relation to the federal head of this covenant, Jesus Christ. And anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So in conclusion, the new covenant of grace established by the blood of Christ founded in the covenant of redemption and preached to the world in the gospel is God's master plan. You see the unity. It is free salvation for the world through the Jewish Messiah, the Christ of Israel. It completely reverses the corruption and condemnation of the covenant of works and provides an eternal life of glory and perfect communion with God. This covenant establishes a kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, and the recipients of its blessings all flowing from Christ the head, constitute the membership of that.